Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny uh, Podcast. This is your producer, Rob and I decided a new name. I am the producer of the latest Shiny Podcast, Stephen Spector. Makes me feel important. And Rob, uh, you are like, important. Your new title works already. The amount of effort you put in and making sure this show is awesome, it's you. And I think it's, I, you, you, I think it's the right thing. Well, I appreciate it. And just for our audience, uh, hopefully by the time this goes, I'm going to put my house up for sale. I'm not moving too far. I'm moving next door to where I live. But if you're looking for a house in Boise and you hear this, <laughs> you can contact me. I, I, hopefully, if my house isn't sold by then, I'll be crying. But uh, just in case, you know, I'm going to, I use all marketing avenues to sell. <laughs> but we have a really uh, an interesting guest today. I'm really exciting. It's a new space for us to go into. Great conversation, looking forward to. So let me introduce Matthew Lodge. He's the Senior VP of Products and Marketing at a company called Anaconda. And Matthew, uh, before I ask you to introduce yourself, how is it possible that the term Anaconda was still around for a company? I'm shocked. <laughs> well, the, uh, they bought the domain name. That was actually before my time. But I, but I understand uh, that um, yeah, everything is for sale. I, I really think it's, it's a great name. But... So why don't we go ahead and, you know, give us a little introduction about your background and what you do at Anaconda, and then, you know, we'll go from there. Sure. So at Anaconda, I run the product management, product marketing teams, uh, as well as the marketing function. So it's my job to make sure that we build the right things for our customers, uh, essentially, and then are clear about how, uh, how we can help people and, um, you know, help them identify uh, what we can do for them. Prior to joining Anaconda, I was at uh, Weaveworks. I was chief operating officer there as a small uh, Series B fund, uh, venture funded company in uh, container networking. And so I was also on the board of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, as one of the elected board members for the, the silver members of the CNCF, uh, helping get uh, Kubernetes and that and the whole Cloud Native ecosystem off the ground. I was also at VMware for five years. I was the co founder of what became VMware vCloud Air. You know, in the past, uh, you know, prior to that, Symantec, uh, Cisco, a number of other startups. Uh, I did a startup with uh, Simon Crosby, who went on to found Zensource. And our first startup was uh, called uh, Seaplane, where we tried to do software-defined networking 10 years too early, uh, which is the same as being wrong. You know, my career really started out in, uh, as a developer, I wrote code that's, um, and distributed systems compilers for the space, International Space Station, Boeing 777. Um, at Cisco, I helped, um, I have connect countries to the internet in the very early days of the internet. So I've had a, a fun and interesting career in tech. Wow. That's impressive. I want you to try and define for us what Anaconda does. Sure. In, in simple terms. Cause that's, you know, when I think of Anaconda, I'm a, I'm a booth provision guy. So I'm, I'm not thinking about what you're taught, what you're, what, what Anaconda does. Can you give me, can you give us the nutshell? Yeah. Uh, so really we do two things. So we help data scientists uh, be more productive and that's the, a big focus of what we do in open source. And then our commercial product is Anaconda Enterprise and that's really about doing machine learning, AI, data science at speed and scale uh, and deploying that internally inside of a, a typical enterprise IT organization. In a very technical sense, right? This is Python libraries. It's, yeah. it's a service. How, yeah. how is how does somebody interact with Anaconda? Yeah. Like how, does, how does a developer or a data scientist interact with Anaconda? Absolutely. So Anaconda distribution is, is our most popular download. So we do about two and a half million downloads a, a month of the Anaconda distribution. And that is basically an installer for your favorite platform. Uh, we support Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. You download and install that. And what you get is um, our version of Python. So we actually distribute Python itself. Um, and the Conda package manager, which is designed to make it very simple to, as a data scientist, to install and use uh, data science libraries. And I'll, I'll get to why that's a big deal uh, in a second. Um, and then in the, the, the standard install, you get 150 of the most popular Python and R data science packages. And uh, the challenge for data science with Python is that it's a, you know, these libraries themselves are usually multi-language. They're there's compiled components. There are dependencies across multiple languages. There are still, you know, Fortran dependencies and some of this stuff, C++, C, all these different libraries. And so the dependencies uh, can get pretty hairy. And on your stand, if you sort of try and install all this stuff in your standard 
Python install that you, you maybe got with Linux, you can uh, you know, just install standard Python or uh, uh, on a Mac, you're gonna end up with this sort of rat's nest of, of dependencies. And, and in particular, if you install more than one package, you can get, you know, some packages need one version, some packages need other, and it's, it's very complicated. And essentially what we do with Conda is that we, we, build, uh, we build binaries for all of these different packages and distribute the binaries. So we compile them ourselves as Anaconda so that you don't have to. And then we install them into a, into a virtual environment so that we don't install into your operating system environment. You know, we, it's a self-contained environment that lives in user space in the user file system. Um, and it means that you can, for example, start using TensorFlow by typing conda install TensorFlow at the command line. You get everything you need, all the dependencies compiled for your system, optimized for your system, and then you can just start using, using it and writing Python code. You're making data science sound super scary to me, <laughs> uh, right? Because what what you're saying is that there's this wild west of components and it, you know all these things that that aren't lined up. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it sounds it sounds like you know all the things that make you know cross language work hard. Yeah, um, and that's the and and what you're doing is you're taking away that pain. So a, a data scientist doesn't want to spend years futzing with a make file. Um, right. Yes, that's that's for the, and then and and so what does a data scientist look like? I mean, not yeah. not like what are they wearing? <laughs> but <laughs> what is, I you know I'm not I'm not going to go try and find them find them out in public. But you know what's what do they care about? What are, what's their job entail? Sure. So data scientists, the, the normal process, I guess, that data scientists are involved in is that so that typically they start out with data wrangling. So you've got to find all the data you need. And, and this is often where data scientists spend a lot of time before they even get into the actual science part of data science. And it's collecting the data, cleaning it. Uh, so you know, where is it? Is it in some other database? Is it in a file? Is it streaming data? And figuring out what you have. There's also visualization comes into play at this point. So there's a lot of tooling out there that's about sort of understanding what, if, what have you got? What's the shape of the data? What's contained in it? And, um, uh, and figuring out, uh, you know, how can I use this data to, to come up with actionable insights? Or in the, the case of machine learning, how could I use this to train a model um, so that I could, for example, do a prediction? So I might have, you know, in your case, since you're you know, in the process of selling your house, um, I might have a bunch of data about house prices, and I might have all of the data from the multiple listing service, and I, I don't know what uh, exactly, you know, how many square foot your house had, how many bedrooms, bathrooms, all of those things that you enter in MLS. And I know the price and the location of the house and all the other things, I know the price that it's sold for. So I could take all of that data as a data scientist, build a house price predictor with it. So initially what I want to do is find out what have I got. And you're also dealing with things like, okay, not all the data is there. So I might have, you know, some of the rows in my table for my house prices might be empty or have zero. And, and so I have to figure out, so when I see a zero, what does that mean? Does it mean it's missing or is the value actually zero? So that's a big part of how data scientists sort of start out. Once they've got the data into a sort of clean format and they've dealt with all of the anomalies and things, then the next question is, if I want to do a prediction, then I need to figure out what the salient features are. So what are the things that um, uh, would help uh, make a prediction? And, and how is this data correlated? You might find, for example, the square footage of a house correlated with the number of bedrooms, which totally makes sense. But what it means is that those are really redundant items in the data. And for that's no good for prediction because you, your, your model will actually be worse if it has redundant inputs to it. So you want to isolate, you want to get rid of, identify things that are correlated with each other and just you know, pick one of those or, or build a, uh, some conglomerate of those. Uh, so so as a feature. What, what you're describing to me is Data science skill sets. Yeah. So all all the all of this work this 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 understanding how to build how to clean yeah. data how to collect model that's really data science expertise. Yeah. It, it's not right. Some of it's just learning how to, you have to know how to use the tools. Yes. To create the results, that's what a data scientist does. Yeah. From that perspective. Okay. Yeah. Because one one of the, one of the things that that was finding me out because I was reviewing the website and. I, I, you're, you're turning data science into a, a verb in some sense, right? You're, you're doing data science, yeah. Um, which, which made my head explode a little bit. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in that field as much. And so, 
Yeah. Is, the, is so the, the process you're describing, that's doing data science. It's, it's basically turning this noise, if you will, into actionable, actionable data. Is that a fair? So at the high level, yes. It, um, you know, the data cleaning is the first part, and then you get onto, okay, so what am I going to do with it? And so the, the data scientist really understands, um, you know, the math and the statistics around how to take data and turn it into actionable insight. And so when you look at the background for a lot of data scientists, typically there's lots of math, um, sometimes with, you know, mixed in with some computer science. But mostly it's about, you know, a good solid statistical background is a key part of a data scientist repertoire. Um, but really the data scientist is, is all about taking data and then figuring out what does it mean or how can I use this to make a decision. So where do, how do they learn to use the tools, right? You're, you've, you've got this great toolbox, you've yep. made it easy to use, but you know, knowing the difference between one type of saw and another type of saw, or even when you, you know, when you need to use it, yeah. how do people get that skill? Is that, you know, like a go to college, get a master's or a PhD in data science? And that's yeah, the way? you can take data science courses now. So uh, places like Berkeley and other major universities now offer data science courses. Um, but in the past, you know, you see people who've done math or statistics or have um, focused in a particular science. So one of the you know, most uh, active areas uh, in our uh, open source, uh, we, we run a, a service called anaconda.org where we can ho you can build packages for other people to use and uh, we host those, you know, Python and R packages. And um, one of the most active areas there is a thing called Bioconda. And these are all bio people who do bioinformatics and biology and uh, spend all of their time in that space. So you get a lot of people from sort of applied sciences uh, engineering backgrounds and uh, they're often so, so that that actually starts sounding like a community yeah around that so right and, and some of the tools that you described already are open source tools is there a open source community piece in, in yeah. building this up and learning how to use it yeah so the the packages are essentially the you know the libraries that you want to use so you might you know use a particular I don't know, statistical method from bioconda and that's in a package that somebody else has produced so, so we as anaconda we take a lot of the very common uh, things. Um, there's a TensorFlow is a great example. The Google's machine learning, deep learning uh, framework is something that we build as Anaconda because we can we can make it much much easier to install than the standard way that Google tells you how to do it. That makes sense. But but that also lets you be the center of community work too, right? So you're to an extent these tools are are evolving. Outside of you, uh, yeah. Anaconda. Yeah, yeah. So we do we do the groundwork, and then there are really uh, there's a, uh, an organization called Conda Forge, um, and so these are all people outside of Anaconda who build uh, Conda packages for whatever they need, and we host all of these. Um, so we provide the hosting platform for this uh, in Anaconda Cloud, Anaconda.org, that site. Uh, so that once they've built these things, they can there's somewhere where they can put them that uh, the rest of the world can get to them. And so we host the site, we pay for all the hosting and the, the network bandwidth, the CDN, and everything that goes. So there's something that you know I think of with machine learning, and I, I, I read about it with the, you know this accelerative effect where systems are getting smarter. And I know they're not getting smarter, um, right? They might get faster. It's, it's the algorithms that are getting smarter. It's the way we apply the algorithms. How do, what does that look like, you know, from your your side as 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 AI progresses in industry? What is it? How does it? How does Anaconda change? So what has happened is in the last couple of years, you know, before I arrived, when I talked to folks who've been here for a while about you know how things used to be, in the past a lot of it was about you know Python establishing itself as um, as a bona fide language for data science, and we're really past that point now where you know, Python is the de facto language and R is very close behind as the second language of data science. But now students at university are taught Python on, and R on their courses. And oftentimes they're taught using Anaconda because Anaconda gives, them, it gives um, instructors and uh, teachers a way to have completely reproducible data science right, and get exactly the same result. Right. What operating right, system. so you're not spending the semester figuring out how to install your tools. We know to install your tools, but also like getting a different answer from the same exercise. Oh, okay. 
right? So there's the reproducibility aspect of this. Is like I want to be, I want to get exactly the same answer, and this also turns out to be super useful in an enterprise context. From an enterprise perspective, you know, I know machine learning is not as it's not exact. Where does reproducibility feel, fit into that? Well, let's say I build a model on my laptop and I'm running on Windows, and I, I build a, a model that uh, makes house price predictions. We can stick with that example. Um, and I train that model on my laptop. It's a small enough data set that it fits in memory. And then I want to uh, make that available inside my organization. It's probably going to end up running, running in a container on Linux somewhere. So now it's running on a completely different operating system than the one it was developed upon. You know, the system looks different. And this is, you know, the, the genius of Conda. It's because it, it, gives you, it gives you complete control over exactly uh, which libraries you have and all of the dependencies and all that lives in user space. You're not dependent on the system libraries. So oh, you wow. have that, that variability you can get. So you can guarantee you run this thing in a container on Linux some, somewhere in an enterprise organization, you'll get exactly the same result you got on your Windows laptop. I had not factored that as a problem. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is this a model training problem more or is it a model execution? So if I was to, to you know, train models. I come up with my model. It's a relatively yeah. small piece of code, um, I'm assuming. Yeah. And I go to apply that model. Do I have the same fidelity concerns with the model after it's been trained? Yeah. Yeah. Because you want to make sure it makes the same predictions that it made on your laptop when you tested it, right? So that's an important thing. The the other important thing for enterprises is in regulated environments is uh, let's say you have a model that um, does credit decisions. And so it gives you a risk score for, uh, sure. for say somebody applying for a credit card, something like that. And there, there are various regulations about fairness and lending and uh, you know, other things that are designed to uh, make sure that organizations are not discriminating unfairly. And so the regulator might say, well, I, I wanna take a closer look at the model that you had on you know, a year ago. Uh, that was used for this credit decision around these individuals. And you know, well, I want to see how it made decisions. So you need to be able to reproduce the model you were running a year ago. Um, so that reproducibility also plays a part in that. I'm, I'm going to take a, uh, a parking lot for listeners to do some homework. Sam Charrington's done a, a whole bunch of AI work, AI interviews about bias in AI models. Um, I don't, I, I'm, I don't think we have time to chase that. It's a little off topic for us, but that is a major topic. Go listen to Sam's <laughs> Twimmel uh, podcast and, and get smart about, about uh, uh, training bias. I'm, I'm interested in this operational side because if, if you've got concerns that your model isn't durable, or maybe what you're saying is Anaconda allows the model to be portable in ways that it might not be otherwise. So you would have to, you'd have to relearn, you have to retrain new models in every, every situation. Mm -hmm. Go on. We, we've had some guests who talked about doing AI models that are very environmentally sensitive, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in intersections or on edge infrastructure where it's a very small constrained environment. Yep. And they've, they've sort of made this assumption that you could train a model and then send it to that edge environment and then have the, the model create reliable predictions on that, those data sets. What you're saying seems to run counter to that, or am I just misunderstanding? Well, it's a, it's a different problem. Okay. Uh, there, there is the, this uh, challenge that when you're training a model, you need much higher precision uh, math and you don't necessarily need um, the same level of precision when you're running a model uh, called inference, the, the data scientists call that running a model for inference. And so here's the problem with that, right? If you look at Google's um, inception image recognition model. So this is Google's implementation of ImageNet. And ImageNet was a contest that was run every year to, do, to see if image recognition by computer could be more accurate than humans. Uh, ImageNet was won, they got to the point where it was more accurate than humans in 2015. It was won by a team from Stanford. Uh, Fei-Fei Li led that team, she's now Google. Google's implementation of that is called Inception. And it's, um, to give you an idea, to run an image through that model, it's got 21 million nodes in the neural network. And it takes 5.3 gigaflops to run that model. Just to, just to execute the model, take just, in an image and give you an answer? Yeah, just to execute the model. Okay. You can see why the edge people are very exercised about this because that's not typically the kind of 
you know, a resource you have sitting around on your arm, uh, you know, embedded system. Right. That makes sense. Or even in the things that we're talking about, where it's an edge infrastructure and it's actual a mini data center yeah. close to your processing, right? If it takes that much computing power to process one image, then a camera, granted, potentially more constrained. Actually, let me ask it as a question, right? So yeah. that sounds that sounds outrageous from a from a scale perspective. If I know more situationally about the system, or I, I, yeah. I you know, can I train models to be like this is a fixed location camera. It's always facing my parking lot. It's always facing for Stephen facing my neighbor's house. Yeah. To make sure. Uh, yeah. There are very very, yeah. There are various optimizations you can make. The other thing is you can do smaller versions that are less accurate. And that's actually what Apple does with Hey Siri. Google does a very similar thing with Hey Google on Android phones. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with, with how that works. And, and now we apologize to everybody who just activated all their phones. <laughs> <laughs> well, they should have trained them to their voices. You know, you can do that now. Right? <laughs> So you, you have the option to have models that have lower fidelity, is what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, that's right. So um, Apple did a really nice paper explaining how Hey Siri works and that you can go find on their uh, research site. Um, but essentially what they do is they, they trained Hey Siri uh, on huge samples of audio of people saying Hey Siri and also saying other things that were not Hey Siri but sounded so right. well, They trained on positive and negative examples. Um, you know, millions of samples. And then essentially what they do is they translate that down into a very small dual layer neural network that runs on the motion coprocessor of an iPhone. The motion coprocessor is an ARM, it has an ARM core, but it's very low power. It doesn't have a lot of CPU power. Um, and you know, that's the idea because it's on all the time. And uh, so you don't want it to drain the battery. And it, so it runs this low fidelity version of the model and when it thinks that it's heard, hey Siri, it's listening to the microphone all the time, then what it does is it wakes up the main CPU and then you run a higher fidelity version of that same neural network on the main iPhone CPU. If in these cases, those, do those models improve over time or are they just burned into the firmware? Well, you, um, what you can do is um, you can improve the fidelity of the model by giving it more training samples. And so there's also a thing called transfer learning that you can do now with, um, with deep learning models where you can sort of peel off some of the layers and substitute new layers um, that are trained on more specific examples. I'm really interested in this idea of accelerative learning, right? Mm -hmm. of, of AIs getting better and better. Yeah. That's something, is that, is the, do the layers contribute to you being able to say, all right, we've got this base layer working. It'll improve over time, I'm assuming, right? And we'll replace it or refine it. And then we can just stack better and better analytics behind that. Is that is that an, a possible effect? So I, I don't have to start from scratch every time. Yeah. So transfer learning is this is this remarkable discovery that you can take um, you can take multi layer neural networks that have been trained on other sample sets. Like ImageNet is a good example. So the lowest level of ImageNet is detecting features like points and lines, things like that, corners. Right. And higher levels of the model, like, okay, so this is a square, that's a circle. And then higher level models are like, this is a dog. And higher level models are like, it's a Labrador. So you end up with this sort of layers of abstraction, you know, different levels of recognition that different, uh, encoded in different layers. The transfer learning says, well, you know, if you have a, a, a let's say you want to, well, actually, this is a really great example. So uh, Paige Bailey from Microsoft did a wonderful talk at AnacondaCon this year. Well, she took ImageNet, peeled off the top two layers, and then trained it to recognize fashion. She trained it on a bunch of photographs oh. of different fashions. And she had a very small sample set you know, of fashion photographs, but she was able to essentially leverage the 14 million images that are used to train ImageNet, and then sort of layer on her own specialization on top of that. So she wasn't building a full model. She was able to say, I, I want to take 80% you know, of this existing and then just let, put in the additional layer. So that is a huge acceleration. Yes. Does, does that, I mean, these layers have got to have huge commercial value. Yeah, so for, for you know, most organizations, their data and their trained models are definitely sort of big intellectual property. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, folks like Google, Stanford, there's a lot of research in these areas. So things like ImageNet are public domain, right? You can, anybody can use ImageNet. But then if you look at something like Amazon Recognition, which is uh, you know, an image recognition that service that Amazon has, then a big part of that is the fact that it's being trained on all of, all of the images that Amazon has. 
Right. I, I was at an IBM conference. IBM's got a huge stake in this also with Watson. Um, and yeah. they're, they're exactly the same thing. It's like, you know, you, your data problem is 1% of the data lake that we're swimming in. Let us help you because mm -hmm. you, know, you don't, you don't want to resolve the, the 99% that we've already done. Right. Is that a, is that part of how it, the, the, the data science community is progressing? Well, it's part of it. Okay. The other thing is that um, a lot of times you don't, you just don't have a lot of data to begin with. And that's, that's a big problem. If you're going to train a, a deep learning network, you need lots of data to train deep learning networks. Right. As part of uh, the point of the talk at AnacondaCon about transfer learning is this is a really good solution where you don't have enough data to train an entire model yourself. Right. You can essentially take, the existing trained model, which is really the aggregation of all of the other data that's been trained on, in this case, 14 million other images, and you're essentially adding your data to that pool, you end up with a model that's been trained as if you had 14 million images. Jumping all the way back to the beginning, right, then, so Anaconda's ability to create some type of parity between all these platforms means that you now that the, the data is the, the models are, are portable where they wouldn't be without some type of commonality. Is that am I making too big a stretch with that? Yeah, it's it's part of it. So the what Anaconda does is you know, we make it really easy for data scientists to get started, right? They can start writing Python or R code against something like TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn or one of the popular machine learning frameworks. We make it very, very easy for you to get started with that. So you can just start coding, not have to worry about how do you install this library and do you need to compile this other thing? And you don't have to worry about any of that. It's all taken care of for you. You just get started to start writing code. We have been talking about data quite a bit and learning and processing, things like that. I also know, especially thinking back to your Kubernetes background, there's, there's a lot of differences in, in procedural style and code um, in the Beginning before we, we we started recording, we were talking about we're trying to remember the the it wasn't you didn't say cloud native data science it was it was something similar yeah. to that but it had that feeling that's how I heard it yes um, how is that transforming the industry from old school you know big data data lake HDFS Hadoop type type thought process yeah so you know, um, HDFS Hadoop was really, you know, sort of came about after 2004. So in 2004, Google published this paper about Ma using MapReduce to basically compute the search graph for Google search. And some folks at Yahoo also trying to solve the same problem, you know, did an implementation of that. And that's, that's what became Hadoop. And so they, ha they had to solve for um, distributed file systems. That was HDFS. And then, you know, Hadoop MapReduce. And sort of over time, you know, Hadoop evolved and more complicated things than MapReduce, but essentially it was this world, world Java world. Uh, everything was written in Java. Right. You could do distributed computing, you had distributed storage. What has essentially happened is that, you know, Google shortly after that, a couple of years later, abandoned that approach and ended up with something that looks a lot like Kubernetes. Right? And Kubernetes is essentially an open source re-implementation of what Google does today with it. It's a totally different approach. And so, you know, Kubernetes is, you know, based on scheduling containers, not Java virtual machines. Instead of having HDFS, you just have things like object storage or big, uh, big query, big table, right. um, you know, highly performant uh, databases. And it's a, you know, it's a totally different world. So the AI leaders, your Googles, your Netflixes, your Uber, Amazon, Microsoft, they do it the cloud native way, right? They scheduling containers, containers, they're calculating a compute graph uh, in order to process your your machine learning model, uh, and you and you compute the graph in parallel, and that that's how you get the scale and uh, you know solve the problem. It looks totally different. Describing it as a as a containerized process, though, seems like you're you're giving up the Hadoop benefit of data locality. So you're you're throwing that out the window. You're saying mm -hmm. I don't care about data locality. I'm just using networks. Yes. And then and then what about specialized Physical infrastructure, right? Like uh, GPUs and access to, you know, the right processor, the right coprocessor to get the job done. Is, is, yeah, are those not also considerations? They're considerations, but um, I mean, this is also another example of how things have changed since 2004. So in 2004, you know, the the reason you had data locality is because I/O was very expensive and very slow relative to yeah. CPU. 
and that's no longer the case. And so the way that Google uh, builds data centers is it builds out separate pods of compute and storage. It doesn't mix the two. And right. in between them, it has uh, large-scale non-blocking networks built from commodity network processes. And in some cases, custom hardware. So Google has its own custom networking gear, for example. Yeah. But essentially what they said is like data locality doesn't mean that you need to physically mix storage and compute together because that's very hard to scale. You can separate the two. You put a very fast non-blocking network between them and you solve, you solve it that way. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I'm, I'm, I've always been skeptical on hardware converged infrastructure and I'm, I, I, can't, I, I can't resist the parenthetical, ha! <laughs> uh, but um, I remember in the, in, in the heyday of, of Hadoop, people introduced Spark which didn't rely on HDFS at all. It was really pulling everything in memory and doing the processing. I think there was a lot of rust in that. Yeah. Um, so what you're describing is sort of Spark Gen Next Gen. Is that a fair assessment of it? Well, it, it's um, it's really there are really three big differences. So the first one is instead of using the Java Virtual Machine ah. container, right? And the advantage there is you can write you now write your code in any language you like, not just Java or Scala. Very practical example of that. We, you know, we have customers where the way they used to do this is that data scientists would write something in Python and then they would translate that into either Java or Scala in order to make it run on the cluster. Right. So there's this manual uh, step in the middle. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's no good if you want to iterate quickly on your model. Your data scientists now can't iterate on the model. They have to, they have to go through this process every single time you want to ship a new version of the model. And that's just not, not realistic today. So that's one thing. Second thing is, you know, this idea that um, you know, Hadoop, everything's a job, very batch oriented. Cloud native applications, containerized applications are basically long living, almost organic structures, right? So you, you know, you're running lots of containers to do a new version. You start some containers with the new version of the code and you delete the old ones. And so, you know, the application is long lived. It uh, grows and shrinks according to demand. Um, you know, and as new features get rolled out, they get rolled out as new containers, and it's almost you know, it's like uh, you know, they're like cells in an organism. The old cells die off, and the new cells take over, right? So that's the second difference. And then uh, the third one is just the, you know the being API centric as opposed to you know Java monolithic Java applications. So everything communicates through an API uh, as opposed to sort of like a fixed framework as is what you have in Hadoop for for how communication works that sort of mandates a particular way of uh, decomposing the problem. Is some of this also, you know, in Hadoop days, we didn't really talk about training the model so much. You're right, it was much more about jobs. Yeah. Um, in this case, right, really, to me, decom you know, separated, I'm building a model with a whole bunch of data, then I'm going to apply the model in, and the, I can see the cloud native applications for applying the model really easily. Yeah. And then I guess the whole cloud, the whole cloud model is I can, you know, I don't want to buy infrastructure to train a model. It's not something I, I do that often, or it's not something I, you know, I, I, I don't want all that compute on premises like I would build a Hadoop cluster for. You just sit there and churn. You're yeah. going to do it. You're going to turn it over. It's a whole different. It's a whole. The resource model's entirely different. Yes. Yeah. I, th I think that's true, but it's not. It's not mandatory. What's, you know, we have a lot of large financial institutions as customers, one of the things they like about the cloud native model is they can actually run cloud native in their own data center. That's some, some cost, they've already got right, it. Right, it's true. And so they can run Kubernetes, Docker, in those data centers, and, they can do exact, and then they can do exactly the same thing in public cloud, and everyone has a mixture of both today. I, but even so, I think that part of the, the model here is it's cloud-informed design choices. Yes. Right? It, it's, it, it can, you can work on premises just fine, but what you're doing is you're saying, because I have access to deep bursty compute, yeah. I can operate this way. And, and 10 years ago, that wasn't, it wasn't a choice, right? It was, right. It, you, you had to go buy a whole bunch of servers. That's right. Boy, so that's a really different. So how does Anna kind of play back into the cloud native data science model? So the challenge for a lot of data scientists is, you know, they, they really want to write code that focuses on solving a particular problem, building a model, um, making predictions. And that's really their focus. And they're, they're not interested in becoming Kubernetes experts. And frankly, they're, 
their employers don't want them to be uh, Kubernetes experts, right? And learning DevOps and all those other things. And so essentially for the enterprise product, we just make it very simple for you as a data scientist. You build your model, you, you hit the deploy button, and you know we deploy that onto Kubernetes with all of the appropriate scale and you know versions and version control and all of the governance associated with that. So we know exactly which version is model you just deployed onto 100 nodes, and we can absolutely do that for you again in a year's time uh, if the regulator asks to see it. Um, so that's essentially the commercial model. Oh, I okay. So we're. <laughs> As, as typical for, for, for me, I'm, I'm getting to some really interesting things, surprising things right at the end of the podcast. Right when I jump in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is the pattern. But what you're describing here is, is it's not just a library and toolkit. It, there's actually a, a, a Kubernetes integration that says this is, this is data science as a service. Is that going too far? Yeah, it, essentially that's what it, it gives you. Is if you use Anaconda Enterprise, you, you can do that data science as a service thing for your data scientists, data science teams. And so do you start with the, hey, you need a Kubernetes infrastructure running, and then we're going to help you take advantage. You know, we're, we're an ISV who relies on Kubernetes being present. Is that part of your, the business model? Well, we are, we are an ISV. Uh, we don't rely on Kubernetes being present. You just run the installer, and we'll install Kubernetes and Docker for you. Okay. You know, more and more organizations now have their own Kubernetes cluster, but a lot of them don't. And so it's a lot simpler just for those guys just to install it. And, and also, it, it means that we can get up and running very quickly. We can up, be up in 20 minutes, which we wouldn't be if we had to rely on you configuring your Kubernetes cluster effectively before we could start. Uh, okay, so part of what you're, what you're doing is you're basically bringing in a, a standalone Kubernetes infrastructure yeah. that works for Anaconda. All right. Yeah, you're, you're not you're not making me as happy as I, I, we're looking for the ISV community who's coming in assuming Kubernetes is a ubiquitous platform, and you're not you're not checking that box for me. You're doing that. You're, um, you're, yeah, you're, I mean that is how we work. For we run a 30 day trial service, and that's exactly how that works. It runs on Google Cloud actually. It runs on GKE. It uses that model. We just haven't productized that because most of the customers we deal with, at least are not at the stage where they want that, or they're not ready for it, or it's, they're not mature enough in their deployment of Kubernetes. But I am sure we will get there in the next couple of years. It'll, we won't have to install Kubernetes for you. I hope so. I, this is one of the things, one of our, our themes we come back to every once in a while is sort of what, I, what it looks like to be an ISV. Our hope is that you know, Kubernetes becomes a platform that allows ISVs to have some portable software, right? Create some ecosystem where Anaconda can say, yeah, just point us at your Kubernetes and you know everything's good. We don't have to take on that, that burden or we don't have to have dedicated infrastructure. But you're, you're right. It's a couple of years out. You know, people aren't raising their hand and saying, oh, I'm a Kubernetes ISV uh, oh. yet. Right. Matthew, we're, we're running out of time. Steven's giving me the, the stink eye on this. Um, and and uh, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and let, us, let us wrap up. How do we learn more about Anaconda? How do we go interact with you, get more information about you? Okay. Um, so anaconda.com uh, is the corporate website. Um, also, if you go onto YouTube, there are all of the presenters for AnacondaCon this year, that we, our uh, user show that we held in Austin, all available on YouTube. You can see the kind of things that uh, people are doing with Anaconda. Some really interesting uh, examples. Um, very cool stuff. That's a great place to get educated. Um, and then you can see me talk about cloud native data science at uh, Strata conference coming up in New York in November. Also, I'll be at reInvent. That's probably the best ways. Or then Twitter. I'm just Matthew Lodge with uh, one T in Matthew, M-A-T-H-E-W-L-O-D-G-E. That's the easiest way to find me. Excellent. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun talking. I love these podcasts where you know, we bounce around a couple things and, and I get to get much smarter on a topic and hopefully the listeners follow along All right. and enjoy it. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll probably see you at some of those shows. So right. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast.